Today is March 27th. I'm interviewing Kevin Brown at his office in Uncasville, Connecticut. This is part two of his interview. Kevin, we left off um, part one where you had just arrived at Camp Eagle. And your first impression was that it was hot and you guys were super mission focused. Mm -hmm. What can you tell me about Camp Eagle and how long did you stay there? Yeah, Camp Eagle was a kind of a moonscape. Um, it was located at the King Fod International Airport, um, which was mid-construction. The airport hadn't been fully completed and built out yet at that time. Um, and what they did is they housed a number of units in makeshift barracks and command posts inside the parking garage of the airport. Uh, and then they shipped most of the rest of us out to a limestone pad that they had created where we staked in our tentage and lived in these tents. Oddly enough, right across the road from us, there was a, an access road, was the Air Force and its Air Force compound. And they lived a lot nicer than we did. And I, I'll tell you, I can tell you a little bit about that <laughs> later. But um, the, uh, the tents that we were given were not standard army issue tents to live in. And I may have told you this before, but they issued us these, they're called hot, we called them Hajj tents, Hajj tents. When the Muslim population makes its annual trek to Mecca, uh, there are a number of provisions that are provided to those that are actually doing the pilgrimage, water and, and tents. So these Hajj tents were literally uh, like burlap sections with toggles like you might have on a sweater with the wood and the loop <clears throat> and you you looped them together and you stood them up and there was bamboo poles bamboo poles through burlap with those kinds of toggles on them and, a, and you stick a tent pole up in the middle so camp eagle and i try i'll try to find a picture of it for you it was i don't know i'd ha i can only estimate it was probably a mile a square mile of these hajj tents for as far as you could see uh, three brigades of infantrymen and all the associated, How many the, men in the whole division was there. The whole division was there. So the whole, you know, tw plus or minus a few detachments, probably the whole 20,000 soldier 101st Airborne Division was housed in these tents on this limestone pad at King Fod International Airport. And uh, per tent was typically, and, and sometimes tents were joined, it was pretty uniform. It was pretty uniform. All tents were pretty much the same size, but in some cases, two or three would be joined. And so I would say, I know that in the tent that I was in, and I was I was living with uh, the battalion staff at the time, the lieutenants that were on the battalion staff, there were probably two, four, six, eight, ten, about 12 of us in this, in this tent. Um, and as we, and as time went by and we sort of settled in, you know, the, the, the living space got a little more, a little less austere, right? Um, but that first day on the ground, there was nothing. It was the moon. There was nothing. And you found yourself, you know, banging in these tent stakes into this limestone ground to put up this tent uh, that you would live in. And we'll talk about how long and everything else, but for about the next five or six months. Um, and the first time you set those tent stakes, you had no idea you were about to go through a shamal, uh, uh, an air, uh, a, a Saudi windstorm. And so, you know, there were, right oh yeah, for, fairly shortly thereafter, huge sandstorm. You can't see two feet in front of your face. The winds are blowing at least 30 miles an hour. Uh, and you learn real quick how to adapt and, and, you know, rebuild and refix things. But no matter how good any of us got at securing that tent and making it livable uh it was not airtight and so you you were living with dirt all over sand and limestone all over everything that you owned uh all the time so it was a it was a pretty unique living experience how long did you stay at camp Eagle? uh from arrival until the air war started which was on and, I, and this is in the history books, and I don't know why my brain is forgetting it, the 17th of January, 1991. So for about five months, we lived there. But we weren't there uh, nonstop 
that whole time because what we would do is um, battalion by battalion, brigade by brigade, the 101st would rotate north to the Saudi Iraq and Saudi Kuwait borders and position as a blocking force. And we would be just out there in the desert facing north, ready to fire or ready to attack or whatever was required or desired at the time. But for the most part, it was a defensive position because that whole while, remember the 18th Airborne Corps is the Army's rapid deployment force. So the 10th, the 10th Mountain Division, the 101st Airborne Division and the 82nd are the first to get the call to get somewhere and get there fast. Along with at that time, the 24th ID out of Fort Stewart, Georgia for a mechanized armored force. They were chosen because they were port side there in Georgia, so uh, or in Georgia, Savannah area. So it was easy to get them overseas. So in the first month and a half or two, it was just a bunch of us light infantry guys laying in the desert with a handful of tanks and mechanized vehicles from 24th ID defending while the rest of the forces from Europe and all across the continental, you know, that, that entire buildup that occurred during the, 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 during desert shield. Well, we were the shield, a bunch of, a bunch of riflemen out there in the, in the sand with a 30 round magazine. And frankly, they weren't, we didn't have enough for a full basic load of ammo when we first hit the ground. That was one of the first things that I remember now that we, <laughs> to reflect on that, what is, what is one of the first, I was hot. We were mission focused and there wasn't enough ammunition. We were, we were making do in those first couple weeks until things really got robust. So this is all about how long we spent at Camp Eagle. We spent five months there, but we cycled north to the berm. We called it the berm. We would be up there for about, I think, three, two, three weeks at a time. Then we would cycle back to Camp Eagle. Different unit would go up. And we did that rotation a number of times. It just so happened that when the air war started, our battalion was forward on the berm. But we, we, we didn't, we never at any of, in any of those iterations, we never left with everything because we always thought we were coming back. So we were forward on the berm, but we didn't have all of our stuff that had been left back in the rear at Camp Eagle. And so in the first 24 to 48 hours of the air war, our battalion had to rotate back to Camp Eagle and then rotate right back up to the berm again. And, and it was, <laughs> I, I could tell you stories for days. It was, uh, it was an interesting time. It was an interesting time. Did you have any idea that the air war was going we to did. start? We did. We did. We had indications, uh, not the least of which were, you know, for, for people at home watching the news and reading the papers, there are, the, there are some subtleties that you don't pick up on that we were able to see. I mean, you could see reconnaissance flights picking up up in the sky. You could literally see more airplanes in the sky. The other thing that was just a, a visual of, of what that massive buildup of combat forces looked like during that time, <clears throat> anyone who was there will tell you about Tapline Road. Uh, Tapline Road runs from the port of Damam all the way out across the border with Kuwait uh, and Saudi Arabia through the town of Rafa, which is a dusty town, which we were near uh, when we launched, past Rafa off into Jordan. And I really don't know where it went from there, but it, it, tap, it was called Tapline Road because it was the Trans-Arab Pipeline Road. And, and it was built, you know, <clears throat> decades and decades before when the pipelines were put in place that ran across that allowed bulk oil to be pipelined out to the Mediterranean and get shipped. So there's a road, and it's not a good road uh, by our standards that runs all along that pipeline. As we were positioned forward it, late at night, it, when we were out there on the berm, you could see, you could for miles, headlights of, of Humvees, deuce and a halves, five tons, armored vehicle carriers, commercial trucks, and I'm talking not sporadically, stacked. For miles and miles down down Tapline Road, you could see just nonstop. I mean, the, the buildup of American combat power on on Tapline Road was incredible. <clears throat> if we didn't have, if the United States did not have air superiority, Saddam Hussein could have just taken jet fighters down Tapline Road and wiped us out before it ever even started. Uh, 
but because we had you know plenty of air superiority that that whole build was able to take place so that sort of captures the essence of it you know you had plenty of aircraft up above you had a bunch of riflemen on the ground hoping that things wouldn't start too soon because we didn't have a lot of combat power and behind John Tapline Road, day in, day out, all day for weeks on end, headlights or vehicles streaming, getting everybody forward. And so, <clears throat> I mean, on a very, very, you know, tactical, personal, real basis, reflection basis, um, you could, that first night of the air war, you could see the flashes in the distance as bombs were being dropped and we had actually begun to engage on the 17th of, of January. And the rest is, a, I can recollect, but it was a blur because we, <clears throat> we had to load up. We had to put guys on, we would put soldiers on, C, on C-130s would land on tap line road. C-130s would come in, we'd load up the riflemen. I had uh, seven deuce and a halves and four Humvees as the support platoon leader at this time to carry all the ammunition, water, uh, and anything that could feed, equip, and arm our battalion of, of 660 men. So I pushed everybody out on aircraft and then me and my platoon got on the road and drove, you know, I can't even remember anymore, the two or three hour drive from our forward operating base back to Camp Eagle. We pulled in, everyone else is already reconfiguring their combat loads to get flown back out again. Uh, we had to unload everything, reload everything, and basically it was everything. We had to load everything up. We had one night staying back there that night, <clears throat> 17th, 18th, 19th, I don't know, somewhere in there, you know. And that was the night, I think I may have told the story before, that we had scud attacks on our location. Um, nah, I've told the story so many times, it, it, <laughs> I guess... You didn't tell me. All right, so... <laughs> Not funny, I shouldn't be laughing, right? Because as you might recall from when it happened, there were some Scud missiles that actually uh, hit their targets at the port in, in the mom. And, and some warehouses in the port were hit and some soldiers, an American soldier, were injured. Um, we had a Patriot missile battery at King Fod Airport nearby. And it was my first experience with a Scud attack and the Patriot missile response. Uh, which is interesting given all the theater high altitude air defense discussion going on in South Korea right now um, and the geopolitical impacts and its impacts on our business wanting to build a casino in Korea. At any rate, this is 30 years ago <laughs> almost, and <clears throat> you could hear the Patriot missile launch. And if you heard an explosion later, that was good because it meant it had actually midair intercepted the Scud missile that Saddam Hussein had launched to hit us. And there were false alarms and those kinds of things. But uh, this one particular night, I can recall vividly, part of the concern and anxiety over the Scud missiles was that Saddam Hussein had equipped them with chemical warheads. And none of us wanted to be engaged in chemical warfare. It's deadly, it's lethal, and it's very, very, very difficult to fight in that chemical protective gear effectively. So we just didn't want to end up there, but we had it. We had our stuff. We had all of our uh, protective equipment. Anytime the alarms went off, you had to don your protective gear. Put the charcoal lined suit that would help keep the chemicals off of your body, your rubber boots, and your protective mask, which you, you put on, you were always trained, you wore it on your hip, and if you heard the alarm for gas, thinking forward, there's another funny story. Um, you had seven seconds by the Army standard to remove your headgear if you had it on, open your protective carrier, protective mask carrier, take it out, strap it on, clear the air out of it so that anything bad got out and now the seals are good, you test it, it vacuums to your face, and then you pull the hood back over and you're good. You have seven seconds to do that. Now, this is only a funny story because I'm alive sitting here today and able to tell it, but uh, it just so happened in that tent that I said I had battalion staff officers in there, I had with me the battalion chemical officer. His sole job, everybody in an infantry battalion, the chemical officer is typically the butt of a lot of jokes because 
you know, we're a bunch of hardcore infantry guys. He's just the chemical officer. All he's got to do is tell us if we're under chemical attack and if we're safe from one that occurred somewhere else and, you know, make sure that we're trained on that task that I just demonstrated. But other than that, and I love the guy, he was a great guy, Lieutenant Johnson. Matter of fact, I think his name was Howard Johnson. Like we called him Hojo, but Lieutenant Johnson, um, that's all he had to do. Well, he was kind of my bunk mate. He, his bunk was literally right across from me. So two funny things happened during this scud attack. How bizarre of a statement is that, right? And funny things were able to happen because the good news is our Patriot missile battery intercepted the scud and the, the, the ricochet and the remnants fell somewhere out in the desert and all was well. But you don't know that in the moment. So we're doing the right thing. So I wake up because of the, the racket. The M8 alarm is going off. Whoop, whoop. Makes that noise, which you know, uh-oh. <clears throat> and you can hear the explosions. Seven seconds, right? Okay, except you're in a dead sleep in a cot with gear all over the place. I wake up, I sit up, and honest to God, the very first thing I see is... Lieutenant Johnson, sitting upright on his cot, looking at me with his protective mask on already. <laughs> I'm like, I'm dead. <laughs> I'm dead. On reflection, I can say it went like that. I probably had huge anxiety. Because the other thing you, you're taught to do is you hold your breath immediately, and then you start doing all this stuff that I just said. So I held my breath, put my protective mask on, cleared it. <sighs> Started to get my stuff together. And it's just kind of chaotic, you know. By this time, you kind of realize, okay, I heard the Patriot intercept the Scud. We're going to be in this protective mask for a while until they do the clearing procedures, which determines that it's safe to demask and take your mask off. But in the meantime, I got to keep it on, and, and there's a lot of racket going on. I got to check on my soldiers. I got to make sure things going right. Well, meanwhile, also in this tent, one of my favorite stories to tell. The battalion intel officer was in the bunk on this side of me. He was about five foot four. Next to him was the battalion medical officer. He was about six foot four. The intel officer used to sleep in the buff inside of his sleeping bag. And the medical officer slept in, I guess, boxer shorts. So in this chaos, they both jump up. <laughs> The medical officer is hopping around on one leg, trying to put on the five foot four intel officer's pants, right? And he's, he can't figure it out. He's kind of bouncing around. And the butt naked intel officer is running around with his protective mask on, yelling, Where are my pants? Where are my pants? Who's got my pants? <laughs> so you're in this moment of potential intense danger and this chaos, this comical chaos is going on. One of my favorite stories to tell of all time, I swear to God. Matter of fact, I reconnected with my battalion commander <laughs> on Facebook within the last couple months and he remembered that and it, the story will live forever. Just just amazingly funny, crazy stuff. Because it's dark, it's the middle of the night too, you know, when this is all going on. Anyway. All that was happening in the midst of, you know, the air war started. We rotated back to Camp Beagle. We put our ProMass on and jumped around our tents and got crazy. We got all our stuff packed up. And then within the next 24 hours, we're flying and driving back north again, but to a new destination. We had been... Not to return ever not, Camp Beagle. And not to return uh, ever is a long time, but for what we knew ever to Camp Eagle. And... Uh, I cannot remember. I think the area that we had been cycling to, back and forth to and from was in the vicinity of Hafer al -Batin in, in, uh And it was kind of an intersection of two highways uh, in Saudi Arabia. When we went back north the next time, we went a good 100 kilometers further to the west out towards Rafa, Saudi Arabia. And, and if you ever see one of those graphics of, of the posture of all of the forces and the and the big the big wheel right the big arc as as Schwarzkopf you know shows everybody this great flanking maneuver that we did pretty basic really to be honest <laughs> um the 101st 
Airborne Division and the 82nd Airborne Division, along with the 6th French Marine Division, were the furthest west flanking elements. So there we were out there by Rafa. Uh, on our way to Rafa, it just so happened, middle of the night, I'm driving through Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and that, that's where we had to take a dog leg, you know, make a dog leg and head north. And guess what? Uh, Saddam Hussein had launched Scud missiles at Riyadh, and we just happened to be arriving in Riyadh in our trucks at the time that those Scud missiles were landing. So now there's total chaos because vehicles are stopped and pulled over all around, and people are getting out and doing the same thing that I just described to you all over again. Crazy. You know, look, uh, lucky for all of us that he never actually effectively implemented chemical warfare during that thing, because it just it would have been... I mean, when I just think about the chaos involved in being prepared and responding to it, I can't even imagine if we'd had casualties or had to fight in that. It, it would have been a complete mess. So we made it through Riyadh. We got to our new forward operating base. Um, and we probably were settled in there on or about the 20th of January. And that's where we sat from then until we actually launched um, on the ground war, what was about 30 days later. Um, so this new base you spent hmm. 30 days at? Right. What was the name of it? I can't remember. I don't know that, oh, it was an assembly area and it was, I think it was AA Camel was what we called it. Gosh, I hadn't thought about that in a long time, but I think, it, I think we called it assembly area Camel. It was just a big goose egg where our brigade was forward positioned. Um, and we stayed there for a while. Uh, was, there, was there housing or anything? Oh, no, no, no. We were, just, we were just out in the desert. And, and I got to tell you, as oh, no more tents. And each of those times we cycled forward to the berm, no tents. It, you were just living out in the elements. Good infantryman knows how to make a shelter out of his poncho, you know. Not a lot of trees to tie a poncho off on out in the desert, you know. But rocks and props and things, you, you figure it out. And I got to be honest, as the support platoon leader, I was probably living in high cotton compared to some of the line dogs that were that had just absolutely nothing. Um, I had my vehicles. So I could bring something up with my vehicles. In fact, that's what I did in, uh, in assembly area camel, if I've got it right, is I took the tarp from the back of one of my vehicles and I made a little lean-to hooch that I could get into if it was too windy or wet or or whatever. Um, well, let's talk about living conditions yeah. back at all those different places. Yeah, so yeah. at the, the Camp Eagle, the first place you guys were, mm -hmm. you had tents. Mm -hmm. What did you do about food? Yeah. So it was a semi-permanent existence that, that Camp Eagle was. Just like, just as a matter of fact, and, and I, I never really did the, the history lesson for myself, but Camp Eagle was the name given to the 101st Airborne Division's rear area in Vietnam as well. Okay, so as a matter of fact, I think we even called it Camp Eagle too. Now that I think about the sign, um, but for us young nuns, it was Camp Eagle, right? Um, <clears throat> so it was semi-permanent living. So we had, in addition to all those living tents, we had uh, some makeshift latrine stalls and some makeshift showers, and I can describe those in more detail if you'd like. If you'd like, and some makeshift command posts all the way down the line for all the battalions and brigades. And then we had three different brigade sized mess halls that were in a tent, uh, like a festival tent, like one of those big festival tents you see now. Um, <clears throat> and again, over those five months, you know, things became less and less austere. At first we were just eating MREs. I mean, that's, and that was nothing new. I mean, that's, Things were a lot different then than they are now. There's an awful lot of uh, Kellogg, Brown and Root KBR contracting that brings food capacity to deployed soldiers in a variety of... Back in those days, it was MREs and you were okay with it and you understood it. Then as we got our mess sections set up and cooking, our cooks were doing their actual... Three meals a day? Their actual wartime mission. Nope. It was... Uh, they would serve a breakfast and a dinner. And when you went to breakfast, you'd pick up your lunch MRE and then you'd go back for dinner. Uh, that evening. And it was, you know, it was decent food. It was a combination of, of um, T rations and A rations. T rations 
are the Army's version of uh, denty more meals at a mass scale, right? Where you, you take a can opener, you think of sea rations from the World War II Vietnam, Korea, Vietnam era. Take sea rations, and instead of it being a single portion, turn it into a 30 portion tin container. That's what tea rations were. And so and they would and the cooks would take that. Boy, I got a lot of stories. Because just talking about this is reminding me of a million things. But you, the cooks would take that that tea ration container, throw it in boiling water, cook it for 45 minutes or two hours or whatever it was, pull it out, open it up, and spoon it out onto your tray as you came through the line. So it was pre-processed, but it was a hot meal, which is pretty cool. They would cycle in an A ration meal, real eggs, real vegetables, real salad, when you know when they could either get again as as the months went by and things got less austere and we found local purchase areas to get goods and create meals then you know things got better and better over time the very best thing that i ever ate in that mess hall was pancakes and and i'll tell you why you can't mess up a pancake right and i had a i had a uh, bunkmate friend colleague who was a chief warrant officer and he was from New Hampshire. And his family shipped him some New Hampshire drawn maple syrup. And I'll never forget the day he came up to me. Nick Plant was his name. He he and I have bumped into each other once in the last 25 years. He came up to me and said, hey man, mail came today. I got syrup from home. Let's go to the mess hall. <laughs> and, and just to have those pancakes with real maple syrup from New Hampshire from home, money. It was good. So that's how we... That's how we. That's how we subsisted there. How did you subsist when you were up on the berm? Um, well, first, before I tell you about leaving, um, the Air Force was right across the road. Every now and then, we would get an invite to go eat in their mess hall. No more than a hundred meters away, but it was like it was a world away, and and I. It, you know, the Air Force just always had it a little bit better than us line dogs uh, did. Uh, and then, like I said, we had showers, makeshift showers, a big, big 100-gallon metal tank on top of a stall. You put, you put cold water in that 100-gallon tank that's painted black and let it bake in the Saudi sun all day long, and by 7 p.m., you're having a hot shower. Yeah, it was magical. Um, uh, but drainage wasn't the best and it wasn't as magical as maybe I'm making it sound, but it was, it was another decent to have thing. And then of course we had the typical latrine drill where a, a large plywood, uh, three hole stall with 55 gallon cutoff drums and you're burning it every night. And that smell wafts through the whole Camp Eagle. So there, that's, that's Camp Eagle living. When we would go forward, during Operation Desert Shield, those first five months when we just do the rotations, um, we the soldiers basically ate MREs the whole time. But a, a short while into that, I went to the battalion executive officer and I said to him, boss, I got an idea. <laughs> you know, these days it's called the MWR tent in Afghanistan where MWR, Morale, Welfare, and Recreation, literally comes in with, you know, a DVD and a TV and DVDs and uh, a freezer full of Cokes or whatever, and soldiers can cycle off and go to the MWR tent. I, I actually sort of created that myself back then because we had extra tents, and I had the mess section attached to me every time we went forward. I said, okay, we're going to set it up, and, and we're going to put a basketball hoop out here and a volleyball hoop. And so whenever the line company commanders can afford to let a platoon cycle off the line, they're going to come back here to Jonestown, is what we called it. Because the mess sergeant's name, yeah, the mess sergeant's name was, uh, he was Sergeant First Class Jones. So we, we called it Jonestown. And in Jonestown, a rifle platoon of 30 guys, 30, 40 guys, we'd go pick them up in Deucin House, we'd bring them back, and at least for a day, they weren't living under their poncho, staring at Saddam Hussein with 30 bullets in their rifle. They were hanging out, getting sun, taking a shower, playing volleyball, eating a hot meal in the tent, and just doing nothing for a little bit. So that was kind of our MWR, our, you know, 
R and R approach to each of those times that we were we were out there. So you know, you get you get uh, instead of just your MRE, you'd get one of those tea rations, which was a big that was a big deal. You'd get some of these locally made sugary uh, like Hostess cakes, pure sugar. You'd get the t the skinny little cans of Coke, you know, that had the Arabic script on them. Uh, mango juice, geez, I, I never wanted to see another box of mango juice for the rest of my life after that. And some local fruits and vegetables, you know. So it was, it was, it was a little something anyway. That's how we did that. Then the last time when we went forward to out by Rafa, that was it. It was MREs. Yeah. How did you stay in touch with your family? You didn't. I mean, you could write, and, and we did, and we had mail call. And out of Camp Eagle, mail call was pretty, oh, you know what? At Camp Eagle, there was an AT&T phone booth. Yeah. Yeah, it was a big deal. And huge, huge lines, hundreds. It, it, the big deal was, you know, hey, save my line. Save my spot in line. I'm going to go to the mess hall. I'll catch back up. We'll trade out. Because people would, people would stand in that line for hours on end to get to those very few AT&T collect call phone booths that were available. Um, wow, I forgot all about that. Except for the bill, collect call bills that we all rang up when we were over there. So that was the way you could connect when you were at Camp Eagle, um, along with regular standard mail. And of course you could, you know, the cool thing, right? The, from World War II to right now, you could write on the back of an MRE box and it would get that, that APO air mail free of charge postage. Um, you could write on anything and send it, and it would go. So we would occasionally get mail call. Uh, you, we'd rarely get it when we were forward during those rotations, um, but from time to time. And then in that last 30 days before we uh, launched into Iraq, I think we might have had one or two mail calls. And this whole time, my wife is pregnant with my daughter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that must have been a little uh, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was difficult. Um, um, and you couldn't communicate and, and probably a good way to sort of move the storytelling along is, is the fact that my daughter's due date was the 21st of February. And from all indications that we were getting, you know, we rehearsed a lot, we planned and prepared, we went to remote parts of the desert and and executed the way we were going to assault into Iraq. And as, as all that began to line up, it became pretty clear that G-Day, ground day, air war had already started. Ground day was probably going to be on the 21st of February, the day my daughter was due. So I, uh, uh, I mentioned the, the little town of Rafa earlier. From time to time, in my role um, as the support platoon leader, I'd, I'd be out on a mission, trying to find, scour, find, buy, barter stuff for my battalion. And there were a number of places and directions that I would go, depending on what I was looking for. Um, and I have a few stories about that. I literally traded tents for grenades. Yeah, that's not in the army supply manual anywhere. Uh, what but did you trade with? Uh, so I, I I took a ride, and you might remember I started this by saying we didn't really have all the ammunition that we needed, and and I could really turn this into one of those great jaundiced storytelling things. Like, those guys back in the rear, they had all the gear, and us guys out in the front, we didn't have anything that we needed, and it, it's kind of like that, um, and and I. <laughs> I don't ever want to, and it's going to be on tape, but I, I don't want to come across as, as suggesting that we didn't ever improve that dynamic in our army from the Civil War till now. But that dynamic will always exist. You know, that if I'm comfortable in the rear with all the right stuff, I kind of forget that my job is to push that forward to the guys who can't have it. Likewise, the guys in the front, a lot of times, can't have it because you just, you, you got to carry it. I mean, we were the light infantry division. The 101st Airborne Division Air Assault was a light infantry division. The joke always was, <clears throat> fight light, freeze at night. Because it, you don't want to carry more than you have to. So more wasn't always better. But now we're about to cross the border into Iraq, 
and I don't care how much ammunition you give me, it's not too much. So the basic load on the books for an infantry battalion of hand grenades, in my mind, was half of what it needed to be. So I went and got more grenades. I was on a mission. And I didn't do it by filling out paperwork and processing it through. I got my home V and I drove to the logistics support area, the LSA. Now, I don't know how many times in my Army career I learned something by stumbling into it, right? But I use this analogy often. You know that scene in Star Wars when Han Solo and Chewie walk into that weird bar and there's all these weird... Th when you're an infantryman, when you're a rifleman, and you stumble into a rear support area where people are walking around in flip-flops or, or drinking coffee that's got like mocha flavor to it. And, you know, things are a little better, a little nicer. It's like walking into that bar in Star Wars. You're like, what is going on here? So here I am, I'm a lieutenant. I drive into the, the LSA, which is the support area really for the entire 18th Airborne Corps. I got no business being in here. And I just happened to stumble into one of my classmates from West Point, who was a quartermaster logistics officer. And we shot the breeze for a minute. And he just thought it was really cool that I had these Hodge tents. <laughs> and so I traded him Hodge tents for some chicken T-rats because my guys were just eating MREs. And I, I, I wouldn't go so far as I've told the story over the years. It's probably gotten a little better. You know, like, oh, I traded tents for grenades. I don't really necessarily traded the tents for the grenades, but it certainly gained me access to the guy I needed to talk to to get more grenades. So Staff Sergeant Randall Fender and I, he was my ammunition section leader. Staff Sergeant Fender and I, you know, scored. We drove back to the battalion and we had like three cases, three more cases of grenades. Basically, every soldier, we had, a, we had at least a grenade for every soldier which isn't what the base code called for. So that's one example. The reason I went on that ricochet is because I often had to stray far and wide to scavenge stuff for my battalion. And one of the ways I did that was I, I went into the local town called Rafa, right down the road from where we were. Um, and that was to get tubs so that the soldiers could just take a Take a, a field bath, stand in the tub, rinse yourself. You got water, you don't waste it. You can use it again, you know, that whole thing. Then you can use it to wring out your socks. But I'd go buy these plastic tubs and, you know, everybody could do that. On one of these trips into Rafa, I noticed that there was a phone capability. And I thought, well, you know, note to self, right? I have to keep that in mind because I'm expecting that my wife's going to give birth any day. Um, that never panned out. Uh, because as time marched forward, uh, G-Day, again, was supposed to be the 21st. And two things happened on the 21st, on or about the 21st of February. And it's, 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 you know, it's archived in our history and in our CNN reports and all that other kind of stuff. <clears throat> um, one, the weather was extremely bad. Those, those shamals I was talking about earlier started to kick in during that time frame. Um, and for a division that was lifted by helicopters, the 101st Airborne Division, that, that basically shut us down. We weren't going to be able to, to do the assault. And, you know, as, rec as the record books show and call it, it was the, it was the deepest uh, heliborne operation ever conducted in American warfare. Um, and I can't honestly remember, I think 100 kilometers into Iraq, we went on helicopters. Um, so we were delayed because of that. We were also delayed, though, too, because uh, James Baker, Secretary of State James Baker at the time, was doing shuttle diplomacy. He was back and forth and trying to give the finger shake to Saddam Hussein with the, okay, this is the last time I'm going to tell you, you know, capitulate, and we won't, cap <laughs> in my words, not his, capitulate, we won't capitate, right? Um, so that... That last second shuttle diplomacy combined with the weather delayed the ground operation by about 48 hours. And I, rem and I remember one of the trips into Rafa, and this is where I was going, I bought a shortwave radio. And so I would sit in my home V and dial that shortwave radio into BBC. And that's how I knew exactly what was going on with, you know, James Baker and all that other kind of stuff. And, uh, that delay, the point of all of this is that delay was sufficient enough 
for the Red Cross to get a Red Cross message to me telling me that my, but my daughter had just been born. What day? 21st, uh, 21st of February. Yeah, I guess so. So to fix the story, I guess it, we were going to go on the... No. Okay, we were going to go on the 21st. We got delayed. My daughter was born. We actually launched, I think, on the 23rd. And, and in that interim was, you know, the time that they were able to get me the Red Cross message out there in this remote part of the desert in northern Saudi Arabia <clears throat> that my daughter had been born. <clears throat> it would be, and I didn't get back to Rafa to make a phone call. So it would be three weeks before I would actually talk to my uh, uh, now ex-wife about the birth of my daughter. Um, yeah. And then everyone knows the rest of that story and, and there's stories inside the stories, but you know, a hundred hours later, the war was over, right? Well, what was G day for you? What was described that day? Yeah. 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 So I had a number of emotions running through me. Um, and they're, and they are complex emotions because, you know, we can all look back at Operation Desert Storm as being the 100 hour nearly antiseptic, hardly any casualties. I mean, that, that's hard to say to mom and dad who lost someone, but we only had, we only had 137 casualties in the, in the, in the thing. And, and again, going in, we thought there were going to be tens of thousands of casualties. So I'm not minimizing the fact we had them, but just on scale of what we thought was going to happen, what did happen. It was a very quick uh, event. So thinking that that's how this was all going to go down and knowing that in my days as a rifle platoon leader, like tip of the spear landing first were over because now I was a senior lieutenant and watching over the whole battalion with the provision thing. I, I had mixed emotions because, you know, hey, I'm the captain of the football team kind of guy. I'm supposed to be, you know, I kind of had that I'm getting left out feeling a little bit. Combined with the fact that one of my peers at the time was still in that role, and I, I got a little teary-eyed because I thought to myself, I may never see him again. And I remember driving around in my Humvee and visiting with all my colleagues because I just really didn't know. And and I was choked up. I was dead. I I literally cried. I mean, I cried that night, and I probably. I probably cried a little bit out of the selfishness of not being one of them getting on the helicopters that next morning, but also the fear for them and the, and the realization that I might not see him again. That was a tough, 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 tough night. Um, meanwhile, I had a job to do, and that was I had to stage all of the loads that were going to fly under the helicopters. Again, the 101st, you know, helicopter born flies not only its troops, but all of its stuff. So we had Humvees that were rigged up. You probably have seen it. Humvees rigged up to fly underneath Chinook helicopters. And we had fuel blivets to fly under, water blivets to fly under helicopters, sling loads full of cargo nets, full of stuff to fly under. That was my job. We had the light PZ and the heavy PZ. All the Blackhawks were staged at the light PZ. All the Chinooks were staged at the heavy PZ. All my HUA fighter buddies were over on the light PZ, and I had to muck around over here on the heavy PZ. So, you know, distance and separation both in role and mission and you know everything but put my mind to it with my guys and we got everything ready to go uh and the next day was probably one of the most spectacular things you've ever you know take all the risk and and possibility of a crash or a death or or a, or a bullet or any one of the most spectacular things you've ever seen i mean just amazing to see this entire division of the 101st in a few trips over the border, put so much combat power, 60 miles deep in Iraq, boom, in FOB Cobra. Um, and so in my scavenger mode, you know, not getting to be the rifle toter guy, I'm, I'm still going to cause a stir. Uh, I, I, I like to tell people I stole a Chinook that day. <laughs> um, I, I watched... I was worried about my guys having enough water on the ground. And so I made sure that one of the first things to go in was we flew in a 500 gallon blizzard of water back. And this is just back and forth, back and forth. I watched a Chinook with a bulldozer take off and fly 
over the horizon. And as it was hitting the horizon, I said to my driver, Roderick McDonald, young man from, from Detroit, Michigan, and I'll go back to that in a second. <laughs> uh, I said, I said, Mac, that load is not going to make it. And you know, the Chinook pilots have the ability to punch a load. If it's unstable, they, you don't want the whole aircraft going down. So they'll, they'll cut sling load on something if it's unstable and boom, out into the desert it goes, right? And I was watching this bulldozer and it was doing this. And all I could think of was that blade and those sling legs and, and that it was going to snap them. I said, that's not going to make it. And sure enough, I don't know, 15 minutes later, here comes a Chinook with like a sling leg hanging under it. And, uh, and I thought to myself, that's my helicopter. Because <laughs> it had a mission. And it didn't have to do it. So they landed, and I told my Humvee driver, I said, hit it. And we beelined for that Chinook. Before the crew chief could even get out of the helicopter, I was out of my Humvee, up in his door, and asking him, did you guys make it over the border? And like, no. <laughs> I said, do you need a mission? And they're like, yeah. Now, keep in mind, right? This is how stuff gets done, right? There are chains of command and command posts who probably needed one. I said, you see that water blivet over there? Go pick it up. So we went over there, we guided in, we hooked it in, and I stole a Chinook and they flew water in to my battalion. And I remember my battalion XO telling me, I, I, I was just flabbergasted. Where is this coming from? Um, you know, small victories, just those, those crazy moments um, and things that you do. Anyway, we got all the stuff flown in. Now I have to line up and drive into Iraq with all of my other ground stuff. So now we're back in Saudi. Vehicles are all lined up and we were in the, the, the GAC, the ground assault convoy. And uh, we drove all night through Iraqi battalions that had been pummeled by um, airstrikes, um, through a friendly fire scene that that got a lot of press. Uh, it was an engineer vehicle, and the young man's name was Fielder. Um, and you know, as you put things back together, I, I it's just weird because that 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 night, that day slash night in Saudi Arabia when or in Iraq, when we drove past that vehicle, and you saw all this American equipment burned up and bullet holes in an American vehicle, and you know how this war is going. You know we're kicking their ass. You find yourself scratching your head like, what happened here, you know? And then you just go on, because you, know, you just go on. And then you, you, when you get home months later and you read about a friendly fire incident with an engineer vehicle, you're like, I, that's where I was. I know exactly. And it sort of captures your, not imagination, but just your, like, your memory, like, wow. He put start putting it all back together, um, and and it <clears throat> and that particular incident got a lot of press because I think the Department of Defense didn't properly notify the family and just things went bad. And and so to read about it, it just you know again it touches your heart a little bit because you realize why well, I stood there, you know I, I saw this, um, but uh, things were things were again you know lots of surrenders and. Uh, our battalion landed just offset from an Iraqi infantry battalion, got in a couple of small firefights, but, but mostly did a lot of uh, uh, EPW, enemy prisoner of war evacuation. <clears throat> and so, you know, I remember, remember this is the days long before the level of global positioning system access that everyone has now. People can pick up their phone and use MapQuest and know exactly where they are, or the, or the app on their phone and know exactly where they are. <clears throat> Back then, we had, we had six GPSs, Global Positioning Systems, uh, in the entire battalion of 600 and some odd soldiers. The battalion commander got one, the mortar platoon got two or three of them, the scout platoon got a couple of them, and the anti-tank company got one of them. That was it. Everybody else was map and compass, like the old days. And this is in the desert. And this is in the desert where we didn't really have the full series of maps to cover all of the terrain that we were going to cover. So a lot of it was just 
you were winging it. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so I remember we had to take, I had a truck full of, of enemy prisoners of war, Iraqi soldiers, um, in the back of my Humvee. And I had to take them to the division EPW cage. The 101st Airborne Division created a, a large scale because it got large scale really fast. I mean, you know, everyone surrendered, right? It was all hands up, mostly. <clears throat> and so I'm doing it in the middle of a shamal. So I, we're driving, and I literally can't see but a few feet past the hood of the Humvee. And I got these Iraqi prisoners of war in the back of the Humvee and a couple of guards and a Humvee following. And I've never yet been to the division EPW cage. I haven't been there. All I have is a grid coordinate, some shitty maps, a compass, and a sandstorm. Uh, as every good story is told, no shit, there I was. <laughs> I am I am writing with, a, with an alcohol pen on the windshield of the Humvee uh, and telling my driver to keep track of the mileage on the odometer. And I'm saying, okay, we're going to go on a 70 degree azimuth for a mile. And he would, he would clock off the mile and he'd say, okay, sir, I'm there. And he'd stop. And I'd write one mile, 70 degrees. Cause I had to get back. Right. 0.5 miles, 135 degrees. And I'd write it on the windshield. So I kept doing that. And so when we went back, I'll hit back azimuth, you know, the, the, the reverse azimuth, the same distance to make our way back in the middle of that trip. No kidding. No shit. There I was. We almost ran into an OH-58 scout helicopter that had to set down because the windstorm was so bad. And we didn't see it until we were right on top of it. That's how crazy the sandstorm was. Uh, we followed our asthmus. We dropped off our prisoners. We started our way back. Things cleared up. And that, that kind of all was by the wayside, but you know, basically we spent the whole day gathering prisoners and running them to the to the division EPW cage. Um, just so happens, take us to a turning point here. It just so happens that um, the we were in the first brigade of the 101st Airborne Division. We established FOB Cobra deep inside of Iraq. FOB Cobra then was intended to be the launching point for the other two brigades of the 101st that would follow us and come through and move out to further destinations. Well, <clears throat> as we all say, we had it worse than the other guy and our stories are the best. We were the only battalion in the 101st Airborne Division that never stopped during the 100 hour war. We never stopped because no sooner did we hit FOB Cobra, evacuate some casualties and reset our clocks, than the second brigade flew in and the division commander cross-attached our battalion to the second brigade, and we flew into the next FOB, which uh, the name escapes me, but it was the one out by um, closer to Highway 8, and that's when the war ended, when we landed out there. Did you have any casualties in your unit during the war? We holidays? did not. We did not have any casualties. Um, you know... We threw a few grenades at some uh, Iraqi enemy bunkers because we had them. Uh, and, and one of the funnier stories is as that particular platoon assaulted that, that bunker complex, they all surrendered, as many of them did. And one of them actually came out saying in broken English, Grenade boo-boo! Grenade boo-boo! Um, he was bleeding from the head. He's okay. And, uh, from my recollection, no Iraqi killed or wounded, just a lot of prisoners. Well, wounded, yes. Uh, just a lot of prisoners that gave up, uh, and we did not sustain any casualties from that. So, When you went to that second FOB, that's mm -hmm. where the war ended? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how did you hear about it? We were, so... Was it like a complete abrupt ending? Yeah, uh, yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty abrupt. Um, so I can remember finding out, getting the warning order that <clears throat> we were going to have to make that second launch. And I remember I stayed at the tactical operations center and planned. I think I slept for about 45 minutes of the hundred hour war. No kidding. I swear I, I'm not making that up. And it was, it was, it was outside the, the 
operations center, and um, and we were in the midst of the planning, and I thought, okay, I'm just in the way right now. I'm not helping at all with planning, so I'm going to go out to the Humvee. I laid on the hood of my Humvee and slept for like 45 minutes until somebody came and hit me on the leg and said, okay, we got to figure out what we're going to do. Because then I had to plan the heavy lift for, from there to the next place. So we did all that. The next morning, the most amazing thing you'll ever see, I mean, the, the glory of the 101st or the story of the 101st in, in the current, you know, Band of Brothers way back when, right, in World War II, is that they are the unit that conducts hasty air assaults and deliberate air assaults better than any unit. But there's a process and you follow it. We didn't have time. I mean, we, we had to go. And, and it was the most amazing thing to see um, 600 soldiers lined up on the flat desert with really little idea of where they were going and what their mission was going to be when they get there, but they were ready. And see these 13 or 15 Blackhawks come flaring and, and watch all those guys get on that helicopter and leave. It was just, it was the magic in motion of your U.S. Armed Forces just to see that just the, the alacrity, the discipline. I mean, it might have felt ugly to us, but for anybody who would have watched it, you'd be like, man, these guys are amazing, you know? Um, so they launched, and then I had to, you know, wag and hoe with my my boys, uh, and we started trekking along. We got to a certain point in the desert, and I, I mean, I, we were all so delirious that I took, I drove my own Humvee. I told my driver to get in the passenger seat, and I drove. And I found myself getting a little woozy as well, to the point that for whatever reason, the convoy that we were in did a dog leg in the middle of the desert. I mean, there's no reason for that, right? It's the desert, but did a dog leg. And I actually had nodded and didn't see it and had to double back. I mean, within an instant, but I, I almost was like, uh Oh, where is everybody? Right after that, I don't know why I remember it this way, but right after that dog leg, the whole thing lurched to a halt. And it was, you know, whatever the history books say, what time it was, for us, it was the dark of night, and we were closing on our soldiers who had flown out earlier that day. And the word came around, the war just ended. And we're like, wow. <laughs> we thought we were going to get into a bigger shooting match than all of this. And, uh, and I just remember the relief. You know, I, I, I laid on my, I got up on my hood, laid back on my hood, looked up at the stars and thought, ah, you know, and just kind of took a break. And then we closed in on on uh, on our battalion that next morning and ended up staying there for what felt like forever. Uh, I think for six more weeks, six or eight more weeks, we just sat there in the middle of the desert. And what did you do, baby? Well, you know, when it's... <laughs> talk about being on Survivor. Um, you know, we didn't have a mission anymore. We, we weren't being told, and, and this is classic, right? We weren't told, yeah, you know, we didn't know anything, right? You know, there's guys, there's guys flying in for peace talks. You've seen the, you know, under the tent, Schwarzkopf accepting their surrender and all, all that's going on over towards Basra somewhere. We're out in the middle of the Iraqi desert. All we know is we're just, when are we going home? <laughs> you know, when are we going home? And uh, day in and day out, it just. Well, what were you, what, were you what kind of a camp were you at? We, we, there was no camp. We were just in no the case. desert. No nothing. no, nothing. We were just for six weeks. For six weeks, just laid up in the desert. Uh, I remember I, I pulled a, I pulled my poncho up against the Humvee and secured it against the Humvee. And uh, I remember waking up in the middle of a shamal. And remember now, there's 600 soldiers in a big, you know, secure perimeter, right? Everybody's facing out, taking turns to sleep or be on guard, to eat or be on guard. But, you know, let's just do it the easy math. 300 divided by 2, right? Or 600 divided by 2. It's just 300 fighting positions wrapped around. And I'm kind of in the middle with the command post and everything. And I remember <laughs> middle of Shamal, and there's canteen cups bouncing across the desert and boxer shorts bouncing across the desert. Because, I mean, stuff's just <laughs> blown away. And... Uh, we just waited. I mean, we just found, we found things. You always, you know, look, every day you had to clean your rifle. You had to clean your rifle. So that certainly occupied time. How did the sand mess with your rifles? <clears throat> you, 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 
you had to maintain it every day, sometimes twice a day, or it would have been dysfunctional. You, you just had to. You field strip, you wipe it down, put a really super, super light coat of oil on it, otherwise you're just going to gather more sand. And that's how you keep it from, from malfunctioning. Um, at this point that we're at now, you would notice that guys would wrap shirts around them and stuff because you really weren't a shoot match. So they just wanted to keep it functional and clean. So you'd see some weird things like that going on. Um, but it was, it was difficult. So every day you cleaned your weapon, you ate, you shaved your face. You might talk to somebody, you might not, because it just got to be this sort of this grind, like Groundhog Day. I've told this story before. My, my neighbor at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, he literally lived right around the corner from me. You know, hey, come over, have a glass of bourbon, you know, whatever. He was a scout platoon leader. I was a support platoon leader. We were hanging out in the desert in that moment, like right near each other. We hardly talked to each other. It was just like, hey, what's up? Because we just wanted to go home, you know? Um, and, and, you know, days turned into weeks. Weeks turned into seeing other units egressing back to the rear. You know, like wondering what in the hell's going on. <clears throat> A quick side story. Um, uh, what time is it? All right, so a quick side story. When we left from that assembly area, bed down by Rafa, one of my Humvees was broken. I couldn't use it, so I had to cross load and left the broken Humvee behind with the division support area, which never crossed the border into Iraq. Well, that Humvee, I'm thinking, is fixed by now. And I ultimately got to get all this stuff out of here that I brought into here, plus some other things we've picked up while we've been here. So I go to the battalion XO one day and I say, um, hey boss, I want to go back to the rear and get headquarters 41, cargo Humvee. He's like, well, we fly a, a logistics Chinook back every other day, so get on it. So me and Nick, the guy with the maple syrup, he was the battalion maintenance officer. It was his job to, you know, fix things forward. He said, I'll go with you. So we get on the log bird and we fly back out of Iraq, all the way back to Sa Rafa, near Rafa, Saudi Arabia, to get this Humvee that's been repaired. It went in for power steering pump, broken, you know, Humvees have power steering pump. We get in, it checks out, everything seems good. We drive all by ourselves, all right? Now we think, you know, hostilities have ceased. This was dumb. On reflection, this was dumb, but we did it. <laughs> We're all by ourselves with this Humvee. We drive into Sof into Rafa, and we buy some shawarmas. It's like the it's like a it's like a uh, it's it's mutton. It's lamb meat wrapped in a pita sort of thing with some you know onions and vegetables. In it. Really good. You can buy them for you can buy them for like ten cents. So he and I must have had ten or fifteen shawarmas each, just wolfing them down. And we're like, okay, that was great. I mean, we were hustling because we needed to get back. All right, we got to go. So we get up out of Rafa, we drive out of the north side of Rafa, we're on an improved road surface, and when we hit the Iraqi border, it just ceased to exist. Now, there was still uh, a road-looking pattern through the desert because U.S. forces had created sort of this road. So like, all right, so we get off and we're driving. About the time the sun hits the horizon, I'm, I'm driving, I'm like, Nick, uh, this power steering pump, I don't think it. he's, ah, it's just the sand. Like, no, I think it's not working. So we pull over, he looks at it, he's a mechanic. He, he goes, I can't believe this. The whole reason it was back there was, it was draining power steering fluid out as fast as it could be put in. So we had, you had one of those moments where, you know, like, like, like in a cowboy Western or something where you just, it's just quiet. You just feel, you can feel the tumbleweeds, you know what I mean? And the sun's setting and we're like, we're screwed. What are we going to do? Large uh, heavy equipment transport trucks coming coming north to south. Like, okay, we're good. We wave at him. He keeps going. So we're out there in the middle of nowhere. So we're resourceful guys. We start pouring engine oil, or what did we use? Brake fluid. We start putting brake fluid. It's kind of the same thing. No, we started putting engine oil in just to have any lubricant. So we're, we drive 10 miles or 15 miles. We pour another can of engine oil into the power steering pump just to keep it lubricated just so we can keep on going repeat repeat it's dark now 
<laughs> I swear to God, if I could make this a movie scene, it would be hilarious, right? It's now dark, <clears throat> and we are we got to do it again. And we're like, well, oh, shit, we're out of we're out of engine oil. We're standing there. We're kind of doing the monkey scratch. Like, well, now what are we gonna do? And all of a sudden, we hear voices, and they're not speaking English. And we're like, oh damn! So we literally get down with Humvee, lock and load. We're ready. We're gonna have a two man firefight in the middle of nowhere, right? As they get closer, we're, we're backed up against the Humvee. As they get closer. I'm like, Nick, that's French. It's the French Marine Division. <laughs> so they come down. These guys were a Marine, uh, a French Marine infantry platoon that was securing a communications node up on a hilltop for the French division. None of them are wearing uniforms. One's got a rugby shirt on. They're just, they're like, and we couldn't speak their language. We're trying to say juice, juice, fluid, stomach, and we're not making it. I point at the rugby guy's shirt. I say, rugby. He goes, rugby. He says, come with us. So we go up to the, com the, the communications note. These guys have wine. They have French rations, which are nothing like a, an American ration. Uh, just another bizarre moment. Anyway, we finally break through the communication barrier. We get some automatic transmission fluid. We get in the Humvee and we drive back to the to the base, or to the base, back to the secure perimeter where everybody's at, guiding my, I, I kid you not, as sure as my Mohegan heritage is sitting here in front of you, I'm guiding us back by the stars. I mean, I'm literally navigating by the stars, and we... They teach you that in the Army? Uh, yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you know the certain lay of certain constellations and certain, the North Star and the Southern Cross and certain things you can use. And so I'm following the Southern Cross at this time because we're, we, we knew we were north of the battalion's position and we were on the paved road. And I said, okay, right about here, Nick, we just need to start driving south. So we bang a hard right and we're just driving straight south in the desert. And we're kind of doing the, do you think we've gone far enough? I don't know. And finally, I'm like, okay, I'm, this is getting unnerving. Just turn the headlights on because we're driving night vision goggles. I, I'm like, I just just turn the headlights on, just for a second. <laughs> One of our fighting positions from our perimeter right in front of us. We made it. Yeah, no, it was awesome. <laughs> it was all stupid. What's the chances of that? <laughs> I'm sitting here today. So uh, we we get in. It's it, it, it was Nick and Kevin's great adventure. That old movie, Bill and Ted's great event. It was Nick and Kevin's great adventure. We get, you're just glad that... Yeah, you're safe inside of your perimeter and you made it and you didn't have an accident and you didn't shoot French guys. That... And I just, I get, I lay down in the dirt underneath my poncho and Nick had this built up camper sort of wooden thing because he was a mechanic. He had tools hanging inside on the back of his Humvee. He would sleep on top of it like Snoopy on the doghouse every night. And in the moonlight now, I see Nick up on his thing. And from those 15 shawarmas we'd had earlier in the night, He's leaning over the edge of his of his shelter going Bleh! and then I went to sleep. <laughs> oh so after your uh, six weeks in the desert doing nothing except adventures, yeah. how did you finally get out? Yeah, so they finally uh, they finally uh, airlifted the battalion out back hop step, you know, back first to the area near Rafa. Recover what you can that you may have left behind there. Hop step back to Camp Eagle. We drove our gear all the way back. Kind of a sad story. Um, you know, everyone was pressing up against the roads as we were driving, waving flags and stuff. Little boy got pushed into the road. Just one of those things that you you live with. We policed him up. We ran him to the hospital, uh, and then we got on our way and left our country. You know. Um, and so, uh, I don't know, about the end of March or early first couple days of April, we're back at Camp Eagle now and, you know, living high on the hog again, right? Relatively Big speaking. Tents still? Back in, the, back in the same old Hodge tents that we were in. And we spent about the next week or so cleaning the dirt off of our, I mean, imagine, cleaning the dirt off our Humvees in the desert because they have to pass the, you know, FDA inspections for, <laughs> it's crazy. Anyway, we got our stuff as clean as we could. We boated it. We loaded up on planes. We spent time shining boots. 
You know, with brand new boots they gave us before we left, and you sit around and just spit shine your boots while you're waiting to leave and go home. And uh, I think it was about the 11th of April, um, we landed back at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, to a bunch of yellow ribbons. To Fort where? Campbell, where we left did from. Did you fly straight to back? Charter, charter plane, let's see, how did we get out? We charter plane from King Fod International Airport, which is right there where we were, to um, to Fort Campbell. We probably stopped in Ramstein, Germany for a refuel, but there was no... But it was basically... Yeah, the there were no intermediate adventures. Now, was this the first time you saw your daughter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, boy, I can't even... It's all such a blur. It was... It, everybody was at the airfield. Um, and they opened up the hangar for families to come in. And I mean, I can, I can feel, I can feel the sun on me. And I can remember my, my I had a son who was only at that point, uh, my kids are 14 months apart. So my daughter was, you know, two months old and my son was 14 months old. And it was all just it, coming home was just such a, you know, <laughs> rush and an adjustment that I really can't remember it other than seeing her for the first time um, was just amazing after all of that. One thing I skipped over, maybe we can end here. So in the world of communicating, in that 30 days that we sat out in the desert doing nothing, they rigged up a communication node. And that communication node used something called the MARS system. I may have described this to you in, in the other one, but the military affiliated radio system. And that's how I was able to talk for the first time to my, uh, to my ex-wife to talk about the fact that my daughter was born. And, uh, and so, yeah, I talked to her on an FM radio, you know, <laughs> through the hand mic. And I think I may have said this in the other, in the early interview, we were talking about things like this, but you had to use military pro words, you'd say over, you'd say out, things like that. And you were sharing the channel with five or six other communications that were going on with other people at the same time. You had to pick out when your person was talking. Uh, and I remember her saying to me, my baby day, my, my baby making days are over, over. Um, that was mid-March sometime. And then, you know, a couple months later, I'm, I'm home. Barbara Bush left my wife a yellow rose. She visited the Fort Campbell Hospital and left her a yellow rose uh, while she was there in the hospital. So that was cool. We've got that pressed in a book somewhere, I think, still. Um, yeah. Kevin, at this point, what were your plans for the military? Did you plan on staying in and being like, or were you just going to do this hitch and get out? That is a really, really good question because that's really where the next phase of my life was going because, you know, here I am. Um, uh, I got two young children. I've been away for, because you remember I was at West Point before we left for, for Iraq. So Saudi and Iraq. So I, I'd been gone for a year at this point. I'd been gone the, the first year <laughs> and, and everybody was going through that same sort of, what am I going to do this forever kind of thing. And to the degree that um, there were at least three or four different lieutenants in our battalion who dropped their paperwork to get out of the army as soon as we got back. I was struggling with the same decision, but there was no way that was the route I was going. There was just, that's not the route I was going. If anything, what I saw was these guys quitting and I wasn't going to quit. And it just reaffirmed my commitment to serving and continuing. And so to, to the degree that, and this is a great transition story to the next phase, I guess, for me. Um, three of these guys that were getting out, getting a refrad, released from active duty, refrad, already had dates to go to the infantry officer advanced course at Fort Benning, Georgia. So, you know, the life of an infantry officer is you go to Fort Benning, it's called Fort Beginning. You go to Fort Beginning, you go to the basic course, you go to your unit. When you're done with that first three year tour, you go back to Fort Beginning and you get your advanced course training. These guys all had dates to go to the advanced course. So in my mind's eye, they weren't gonna continue. I wanted one of their dates to the advanced course. 
So I literally on a on a uh, Friday called the branch manager, the branch HR guy, and said, "Hey, I want to go to the next infantry officer advanced course that's starting in late July." And he said to me, "And you know that you know little saying, be careful what you ask for, you just might get it.'" I said, "Yeah, I want I want one of their dates," and he said, "Okay." <laughs> so I was left thinking, well, I didn't think it was going to go like that. He said, call me back Monday morning and we will cut you orders to go to Fort Benning. I, I kid you not, it, Monday morning, I had to start clearing Fort Campbell because the class started the following Monday. And the Army standard is you get five to ten days to clear one installation to go to the next. So I literally went to the... Uh, officer retention branch office and called him from there and they cut my orders while I was sitting there and 15 minutes later I was clearing the installation and leaving Fort Campbell and going to Fort Benning, Georgia. Did you take the family with you? And we had to figure that out because it all happened so fast. Luckily my wife was from Nashville at the time so I parked them at grandma's house in Nashville. I cleared the quarters and I went and signed into Fort Benning and then came back for them later and we all settled down. So your next episode is you at Fort Benning. Had you decided, did you think about it then that you wanted to stay in? Yeah, that, that, at that point I had definitely made made up my mind that I was at least going to do this and be a... years. Well, I, I wouldn't go that far, but I was going to at least be a rifle company commander, uh, captain. You know, I didn't want to get out as a lieutenant. I wanted to give it another round, another go, and and you know move from leading 30 or 40 soldiers to commanding a company of 120 to 150 soldiers. That was the next step. That's what the trip to Fort Benning got me ready for, and that was the next thing that I did at Fort Hood, Texas.